Welcome to this edition of our Faith and Freedom Tour. Perhaps as you can see from the scenery around us, we're no longer in the city of Philadelphia, but we've traveled to the outskirts of Philadelphia to a very, very special place known as the Valley of the Forge. Or perhaps when we were children, we learned it as Valley Forge. This was a very important place in the history of America. In fact, if what happened here hadn't happened, there probably wouldn't have been an America. Once again, I welcome my brother, mm -hmm. Peter Wilbeck. Uh, Great for to be with you, Dr. Stephen Grant. What an honor. Likewise, and uh, we've come all the way out here to this beautiful setting, which at the time wasn't so beautiful <laughs> because it was in the middle of winter. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what happened. Why is this place so significant? Well, as we remember the story of the first 911 in American history, when Washington lost at Brandywine, the British go into Philadelphia unopposed. Where does the army go? They have to retreat and it is winter. And so they end up coming to this high ground more than a day's journey away from Philadelphia. So one, they could see where the enemy army might come from and not be surprised and also be protected. But the problem of this location is that it was nothing but a bunch of trees, maybe a few fields and farms. So everything they had had to be created or found. So these huts were made essentially out of chopping down trees, finding mud and clay and creating them for 10,000 soldiers. Wow. Amazing. And so the Battle of Valley Forge was not a battle of bullets. It was a battle of despair, despondency, hunger, and defeat. And it's amazing that Washington was able to keep his men together as they had to forage, hope that farmers would be willing to take guaranteed payments for crops that were taken, hoping that the Schuylkill would stay open and maybe upstream some things would come down. So it was a very desperate place. In fact, as you think about its geography and its name, it's almost as if there was a providential hand in it. Why? Because when you take the name Valley and Forge, a valley is a low place. A forge is a place of hardening and shaping. This is the place where America is in its very lowest place. The whole story of America could have ended here decisively. A forge, this is where this ragtag army was shaped into the convictions of Washington and his vision for the future, because he didn't quit when all was lost. Yeah, you've often said that the, probably the two greatest things that Washington did were actually things he didn't do. That's right. And those two things were? He didn't quit when all was lost at Valley Forge. And he didn't become king when all was won at Newburgh, New York. Which is what usually happened in Europe when <laughs> somebody right. was the military victor. In fact, we'll talk later about why he was called the New Cincinnatus. And that's a great story of Washington. But that's ahead of our time. So let's go back for a moment. And so it's a valley, low place, forward shaping, but it's also its geography. There's two mountains that come together that create this valley where the stream goes by where the forge is. The one that's closest to us is called Mount Joy. The one on the other side is called Mount Misery. Wow, what a they, they were named that before these men ever came. There already was a Valley Forge. There already was a Mount Joy and Mount Misery. So when they came here, there was misery. But it was here because they didn't quit that they got word that the French were going to stand with the American cause and there were huzzas uh -huh. being celebrated. Why? because they had the joy of knowing they were not alone in their vision to have freedom. So there was hope. There was hope, and hope brings a lot, a lot of strength and encouragement. But so, it is a credit to Washington's charisma as a leader to be able to keep an army together in conditions like this. Yeah. And so uh, one of the things that impresses me about this place, as you alluded to, is that when the army showed up, they were disorganized, they were despondent, They um, really didn't know how to march together and fight together as, as well as the British. But they left here an army, because yeah. while they were here, they received training. We'll say more about that when we, when we get there. But uh, this is such a significant place to think, you come in having just lost a major battle, you're disorganized, but by the time they left, they were ready to stand That's right. tall against the British. So this was a, a time of training for their soul and for their military strength. And of course, when you look at these uh, huts and then you see where Washington's headquarters were, so people will say, well, he really had a nice cushy house or these guys had this. But Washington understood that while he was a leader 
he was with his men and one of the ways he encouraged his men, he said, I will be the last man under roof. You will have built all your huts before I ever move into my headquarters. I'm gonna stay in my tent. So you guys get the job done because I'm shivering more than you are. <laughs> And when he moved in, it was filled from top to bottom with military officers. So really, it wasn't a cushy place to be. He wasn't the only one just in there enjoying the luxury of a house, but it was a pretty busy place. That's right. It, you have to remember, the only way they could communicate was by direct orders or written orders. Everything had to be written in there. So that you can imagine, there's just people writing, getting stuff out, just giving communication to messengers. Amazing sort. But... This place is very special in Valley Forge, in my opinion, not only because it's an opening to this wonderful place, as you can see the high ground looking at the distance, as you see the huts that are, of course, reproductions. The early huts decayed over 150 years ago, and they've been replaced now for the park. But this is a special place because of what happened here. Perhaps you can tell us uh, what the Muhlenberg name means to you as a minister. Does that have any significance? Well, it definitely mm -hmm. does. The Muhlenbergs uh, uh, feel very close to them, being uh, brother pastors, <laughs> which uh, raises a very interesting concept that uh, was uh, actually coined, the phrase was coined in the British Parliament because there was a member of parliament who made reference to the black robed regiment <laughs> that was worth more than a whole regiment of soldiers. And what he was referring to were the preachers that the ministers generated a lot of energy and uh, devotion uh, from their congregations for the revolution. And some of those uh, uh, members of the Black Robe Regiment actually pulled together whole companies of men to fight in the revolution. And the Muhlenbergs actually led some of their men and were here. So tell us about the Muhlenbergs That's here great. in this place. So as part of the Black Robe Regiment today, Dr. Grant, thank you for remembering that ministers, clergymen have had a big impact on the American story. Well, I find it interesting that uh, the king uh, at one point even referred to is this as the Presbyterian Revolution. That's right. Realizing <laughs> that a lot of the energy was coming from those pesky Scotch-Irish <laughs> and their desire for a republic form of government. Uh, but also that the clergy were very much involved in, in uh, of, of fomenting the spirit. And in this case, it's not just the Presbyterians, it's the Lutherans too. So in this particular <laughs> case, the Muhlenbergs were Lutherans. That's right. So the way the story goes is this. There was a man by the name of Henry Melchior Muhlenberg who came from Germany, speaking German, to establish the Lutheran church in the colonies where there were German settlers coming. So he was an itinerant preacher, missionary, establishing churches. He had two sons. And those two sons, one named Peter and another named Frederick, he, they were raised and then sent back to Germany to get a good education. So imagine, these fellows spoke German, English, and they were trained in Greek and Hebrew and read Latin too. They were highly educated even for today. Mm -hmm. But in that day, they were extraordinary scholars. They came back. Uh, Frederick went to New York to establish a church. And then uh, Peter went to Virginia where he got in contact with George Washington. It just so happens on a particular Sunday while he was preaching, he had on his black robe, his Lutheran preaching robe. And he said, let's turn to Ecclesiastes 3. And he said, there is a time for everything under the heavens, mm -hmm. a time for war and a time for peace. And with great solemnity, he said, this is a time for war. Yeah, as much as we may regret that, that is, is yet still a biblical concept. As much as we despise war and, and, and don't want it to happen, Unfortunately, because of human depravities, we've talked about before, because of the sinfulness of man, sometimes there are things that are worth fighting for as much as we would not want to do it and want to have another option. That's right. But sometimes we are called to that. And so the Bible affirms that there certainly is a time for peace, but there also is a time for so, war. For example, Joshua, the great leader of, uh, mm -hmm. represents, his name is Jesus in the Old That's Testament. That's right, Joshua. <laughs> and he led the army of Israel. And yeah. so there are godly military leaders. So there is a time when war is necessary. And this was one of those times. But what was amazing about the sermon, he basically said, I think we're going to have to stand for our dear freedoms and follow the leadership of Washington and others. And at the end of his sermon, he opened up his robe and underneath was the uniform of a continental officer. Kind of an amazing display. You know, it's kind of like Clark Kent Superman. <laughs> this is now Peter Muhlenberg, officer in the Continental Army. And at that moment, he had arranged to have men beat the drums in the back. 
and he said, I want all the men here to march with me. We're going to fight with Washington. I often say to the ladies who might be listening, imagine you finally got your husband to church, church. on Sunday and off he goes. And the pastor for takes him out. <laughs> and they, they didn't get back in some cases ever, but That's right. up to eight years, they're gone. The serve. extraordinary thing is about his leadership is he made it clear, just like when uh, God wanted Abraham to sacrifice his son and of course stopped him from doing it. He didn't ask Abraham to do something that he himself would not do. That's and eventually he did give his own son for our salvation. And here Muhlenberg, by opening his robe dramatically like that and showing the uniform, I'm not asking you to do anything that I myself am not willing to do. That's in called fact, great I'm, leadership. Exactly. I'm fact,ly going to lead you in this. That's great. So now think about the family dynamics. Here's this minister father who says, my son is now in the military, who, by the way, he was up here close at a little town called Trap. When Peter Muhlenberg's brigade is here, he says, I've got to go visit my son. He's that close. And so we find in his record, what was written as a diary to be sent to the officials in Germany, because he's a missionary. So he's giving his record of what he's doing. He said, I want to report what happened. I heard today in camp that George Washington came to the Muhlenberg Brigade and he told all his men to put away cursing and swearing. How can we expect God's blessing upon our arms if we imprecate the name of the God to whom we're praying in Providence? Uh, what a great uh, sense. And then Muhlenberg goes on to say, this Washington is not your typical man of the world. He's a man who loves his Redeemer. And I believe that's why God has blessed him and spared him in times of danger when he has been leading his men. And so it's an extraordinary testimony by a minister whose son is a minister who could verify all these things personally. Mm -hmm. And it's written for all of us to see. And that was not written by some right wing fundamentalist American who wants to have a Christian America. It's written by a, a missionary who can knows whether a man is really a confessing Christian or not. He said Washington was. But now the story gets even more fascinating because it's not just the father with his son who's a military officer. What about that brother over there in New York? When he hears that his brother Peter has gone into the military, Frederick is irate. He said, what have you done? You've been trained to be a clergyman, a minister of the gospel, and now you're out running around doing war. This is not right. Well, he too had an epiphany because when the British landed and invaded New York, one of their strategic things were to neutralize the churches because they were hotbeds of communication and patriotism. And his church was burned down. And suddenly he said, maybe my brother is right. And so he ended up leaving. He came to Pennsylvania. This is where his father was. He left his post because his church is now under attack. And it was here that he became part of the cause. And as a result, he will end up becoming part of the political order of, of America. And when the Constitution is ratified, George Washington, former general, now president, is in charge. He is elected and he goes to Congress and this very educated man is elected to be the first Speaker of the House. Uh -oh. So I don't know what your politics may or may not be, Stephen. It may be Nancy Pelosi or Newt Gingrich, but we, you know, Speakers of the House are strategic people. Well, why that's important is because he will have the privilege to sign the Bill of Rights into law in that first administration, the First Amendment that gives you and I freedom on federal property to talk about Jesus openly and say, I'm not worried. The Gestapo are not coming to neutralize right. us. We have freedom of speech, the freedom to exercise our religion. And that was signed into law by a minister of the gospel who reluctantly at first, but then willingly said, I need to get involved in the public cause for the sake of my neighbor and for the kingdom of Christ. What a beautiful testimony for why we should be part of public theology. By the way, that was part of your doctoral ministry well, thesis. Well, it was, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so you gotta read Dr. Grant's work because that's filled with wisdom. But anyway, this is the story that I begin at Valley Forge because it's such a powerful testimony for well, God's goodness. Well, something you alluded to is I find very fascinating is the, is the attitude of the British when they would go into a village, what's one of the first places they went to either burn down or to uh, uh, also maybe stable their horses is the church yeah. because the church was such a, a strong force in, uh, uh, in, the form, in forming of this revolution. 
And so they wanted to neutralize the church. Well, we, this area where we're uh, currently standing is in fact where the Muhlenberg Brigade was encamped, is that correct? Yeah, these, these would have been the places of their huts. And so we're standing in a place where Washington would have been, where uh, Reverend Missionary Muhlenberg was, where uh, Officer Peter Muhlenberg was, and where that testimony of Washington essentially taking the Bible and saying, honor the God of the universe to whom we pray happened right here. Well, we're gonna see some other uh, parts of the Valley of the Forge. <laughs> so let's move on to our next stop. What a great privilege. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs>